<laughs> anyway, welcome back to part two. We decided that we'd take a pause. Um, it meant I could go and fill up my wine glass, if nothing else. Um, and um, if you haven't heard part one, you should go and listen to it because it's been, I really enjoyed it. It's been lovely chatting to Clive. Um, and um, uh, we just talked generally about people's approach to science and welfare and, and really nice chat. And I said, well, I really, you know, I want to talk to you about dog is love. And in this part two, we're going to focus perhaps on dogs much more. But we do have Zephos. Can you tilt your camera down again? Let's see if we can. The, the Zephos who features so much. Famous in this Zephos. Book. The famous Zephos. You can see Zephos, Zephos there. Okay. Zephos, hello. It really doesn't respond to voices coming out of the box. No. I think, no. I, think um, I would take a behaviorist approach on this. I'd say there's never been a consequence to anything a voice says. You need to be feeding him treats as I go tick, 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 tick. Well, there we are. We could, we we go. could do that. We um, could do that. There did... is a guy who's invented a box that does that. That... Um, that he he tells me that it trains your dog you record your voice and the box then speaks your voice has some kind of computer camera that detects whether the dog is doing you know sitting or whatever and then gives it a treat so yeah. you, your sound has gone a bit weird in this second one by the oh, way oh has it i don't know what's happened but i don't know something seems to have gone a little bit. just anyway. by squishing the computer around a bit i may yeah have... that's better that sounds clear okay and there we are anyway. Um, yeah, I, I have a friend in Brazil and he sort of, when he was over in the UK, he sort of it got his dog to do all sorts of tricks through the oh, really? internet. Yeah. Just to show that he could, he could do it. But, um, yeah, it, it's interesting. So let's talk about dog is love. Yeah. Um, and I go on a start. I don't want to be too provocative. I, 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 I really, really enjoyed reading oh, the book and as I said, but I got to ask this question what do you mean by love because i'm not i'm not sure yeah. i fully understood where you, you know what it, it's i mean it's a great way of selling a book and it's a great book um but but i'm not sure i understood what you meant by love and yeah. when you say dogs love people what you mean by that especially given your history as a you know thinking about the instrumentalization of behavior yeah yeah sure well i mean it's a fair question and i think what I'm getting at is um, strong attachment bonds, the kind of bonds that exist between infants and parents, uh, between, you know, adults in strong, loving bonds. I see I'm using the word love as part of the explanation for the word love um, uh, that you see reflected in oxytocin changes in hormonal changes and that you see behaviorally in seeking out each other's company uh appearing to um to you know be more more bold more willing to explore um so let me can i just share with you where i'm coming from yeah. with this yeah. because this this is where you know I, I the work some of the work i'm doing at the moment is uh, as you know i work a, I, I was I had good fortune to meet yak pangsep a few times and he, he was a great inspiration for my approach for dealing with problem behavior and the importance of emotions. Where we differ is he, he tends to talk about circuits. I talk about networks, really, because I don't see them as discrete. I see them as very much interplayed with the emotions. And we've added a few to his affective systems. We've added um, pain um, because I think certainly you think chronic pain meets the requirements of a, an affective system. He calls it a sensory effect. We've also added what I, what I call a hate system because i think you know from a biological point of view animals do have a strong uh uh tendency to exclude freeloaders from their social group um you know there's a massive ethological literature in there um and at a personal level how are you going to characterize it i'll call it the hate circuit because it's a very much a social emotion now for me and uh, you know my I, I accept the stuff on attachment. I take a fairly traditional and perhaps limited view on what attachment is. It's the bond, as you say, between an infant and their caregiver. And the care, the, so a, an infant is attached to their mother. And this, this was sort of Bowlby's view, you know, but a mother is not attached to the infant. It's a different, that's a, that, and, and Panksit would call that the care bond. And, you know, as I've looked at relationships, I'm increasingly interested in their emotional definition, but rather than just categorize it as attachment, as a lot of people would, I think about all of the emotions and think, well, 
you know, the way that you interact emotionally with your pet defines the relationship. So at one extreme, if you um, if you just give your pets treats and I, I, you know, and I do see this and it's quite sad that people who are just click treat, click treat, click treat. I, I think their dogs probably just see them as food dispensing machines because there is nothing else in their existence that seems, you know, every time they, I'm, I'm sure they love their dogs, the owners, but they seem to think that food is the only reinforcement that you can give a dog. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, th if you think about it, you've got, you know, caregiving bonds, you've got the, the, the bond of the care receiver. And I think you can exist in both of those capacities with the dog. You know, your dog can see you as the caregiver, but also the, the care receiver in certain circumstances. If you want to be protected and you ask your dog to protect you, then he will yeah. take on that role. And relationships yeah. are very dynamic uh, and flexible in that way. And, um, you know, uh, the, the, the play, what Panksip calls the play system and, you know, affiliation, where you just, you know, individuals where they share a common goal they will often work together and yeah. an emotion the emotional bond that can go there if it's just purely for the sake of exploiting a resource there doesn't have to be an emotional bond but if there is by being a team if you like yeah yeah then that is different to attachment and that is different to care that's about yeah. you know i enjoy being in a company we were talking in the first part about you know um uh God, I've drunk too much wine already, haven't I? <laughs> um, <laughs> about playing, about playing together. But you know, yes. playing is reinforcing. But if it's social play, and social play is different to object play. Interesting. Yes, yeah. Your paper. I might come back to it. But did you see that paper recently that's come out where they're claiming that whether or not stick chewing in dogs could be a form of tool use? I saw that there was yeah. such a paper. Yeah. Okay, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's let's park it. Yeah. But I, I just I just because yeah. because I'm. It's Friday night and I'm drinking red wine. <laughs> I got to say it now. Um, yeah. Interesting thought. I haven't fully read the paper yet, so I probably shouldn't talk about it. Um, but, you know, and so, you know, what I try and show the students is if you think about the relationship, the relationship, your emotions are always active. You know, the, the, the brain is made up of living cells. Those cells have to be active. The way it controls itself is through inhibition, not excitation. And again, I think that's one of the big differences with the behaviorist view about this stimulates this actually this reduces the inhibition on this which allows this to be expressed because those behaviors are there whether you like it or not yeah and it, it takes a different perspective so if you then think well all of these emotions are there and these emotional systems or networks which are and i call them networks because they are so spread around the brain and influencing so many aspects from perception to behavior to cognition etc um, rather than thinking of them as circuits in the way that Pangsep did, then we take the relationship and we think about the social emotions. And, you know, I can think about my relationship with you and um, I don't know, I'm not sure that there's an awful lot of care between the two of us. <laughs> yeah. I'd, look after, I'd look after you if we were down the pub. Yeah, I'd look after you if somebody um, started to hassle you. I'd stand up. You're a few years <laughs> older than me. I'll look after you, you know. Um, <laughs> you might look after me um, to a certain degree. But most of it would actually be affiliation. We'd, we we yeah, just get on yeah. and have a laugh together. Yeah. Um, and if you think about puppy siblings, you know, then they probably, there's a lot of affiliation there, but it might be that one does look after the other, in which case there's a lot of care, emotional care in that relationship. And the one that is being cared has a lot of attachment as a result. And I, to, and I just... I guess sort of so understanding what love is well obviously love exists in different ways you can have fraternal love and you can have sexual love and you can have you know uh, paternal love and that, those sorts of things and I'm just sort of I, I'm trying to move with with my own thinking and my own research trying to move out of just compartmentalizing it into that and that's why I was just sort of intrigued as to yeah, you, you mentioned attachment and we can measure attachment. And again, there's always that temptation of scientists to think, ah, I can measure this. So this is what defines it. And I think we need to be personally, I think we need to be smarter in thinking about the diversities. There are certainly some people where clearly the relationship between the owner and I know some people don't like the word owner, uh, but you do own a dog legally. That's the way it is. You know, the owner and their dog is the dog is attached to them and the person cares 
for them and provides for them and, and the dog never has to reciprocate. But you get something like a guide dog and the guide dog has to know when it has to take the initiative and overrule whatever the, the human is set telling them to do. And again, from my own experience in problem behavior, you know, it works with guide dogs because they are so good at training the dogs as to these are the cues you use and you know when you have to take control of that situation. Yeah. In, in problem behavior, often it's the lack of consistency of knowing when that relationship has to change in its balance. And as I said, I, I present to the students like a pie chart of different social emotions and say, well, you know, think about your relationship with your dog. How much of this and that would you put in? And of course, every student produces a different pie chart. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, where am I going with this? Um, so, yeah, it's much more dynamic. Um, yeah. And I think it's so much more than just attachment, which is what everybody's talking about. But that's probably because people can measure it. And I just wondered what you, yeah, your thoughts yeah. were on that. Well, so, so, I mean, my honest feeling is, despite having written a whole book about this and presenting myself, as it were, as the sort of the expert on dog love, my honest feeling is that, in, that this is one of several crucial aspects of dogs' behavior in human societies that has hardly been touched. And that we really have only the glimmers of a sense of what the nature is of the affectionate bond between people and the dogs in those cases where dogs and people have affectionate bonds. And that we talk about attachment because there is this thing, the Ainsworth Strange Situation Procedure, which was developed by, um, what was her first name? Mary. Ainsworth. Mary. Mary Ainsworth. Mary. Mary Ainsworth who was a follower of John Bowlby, who had this whole set of theorizing, which ultimately actually went back to observations of animals, went back to classic ethology, mm. right? The imprinting yeah. back to Lorenz. And um, so we have a procedure. It's not really a great procedure. It's rather too complex. It's rather messy. It primarily looks at what you could call the stress of separation. That's the primary thing that goes on there. You take an individual who you think ought to be attached to another, an infant, to a mother, a dog, to its owner, master, companion, guardian, whatever term you like, you separate them and you look to see at the animal's behavior, at the child's behavior, whether the child appears to be stressed by that separation. That's what we mostly have data on. And we mostly have data on it because, hey, um, some of the people at the Budapest group 20 plus years ago had the idea of trying this. They got some interesting findings. We have, I mean, the natural question that lay people and other experts ask is, well, you know, maybe my dog, you know, I remember I was doing a radio interview when I was in the UK for Radio 2, right? And the guy says, well, yeah, but my dog only acts like this because I feed him. And there's a good question that science has never attempted to answer. How come we've never tried putting people in the Ains people and their dogs in the Ainsworth strain situation procedure who, who tell us, these people would tell us, I love my dog, my dog loves me, but for some reason, they never feed their dog. I mean, maybe they're very, very wealthy and they have staff who feed their dog for them or something. How come, I mean, they were, how come we've never actually tested that? So, this, so is, this happens again and again, that the most basic questions have not been investigated. So I, I, I know where you're coming from. And, you know, we did the Ainsworth test in cats and, okay. you know, there are two groups that have looked at the Ainsworth test in cats. There was Edwards who did it and they claimed that cats were attached. We looked at their methodology and said, given the measures that they use, there are these potential confounds. Doesn't mean right. that what they did was wrong, but they reported absolute values and the, the owner spent more time with the dog than the stranger. So there's an immediate bias there. So we said, right, we're going to. So we adapted the uh, counterbalanced version. We ran it with cats. Now, the first thing that came through with cats was um, most of the measures were really unreliable. So when you do the counterbalance, you went through it one way and then went through it the other way. Yeah. Um, and we did, every animal um, sort of went through in effect a double version and their behavior was just not consistent the second time okay. in that situation. Yeah. Now that, yeah. that seems to be quite common in cats. Um, and the interesting thing, and, and, and I know Monique, obviously one of your former students, and this is, um, you know, and when I looked at what measures were reliable, the only thing that we could find pretty much was that the cats 
did more meowing at the door when the owner wasn't there. Now, to me, that's not strong enough to say that it is attachment. That could just be frustration because yeah. the owner is the provider of resources. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that cats do not have an emotional relationship with their owners. Personally, I think they do. But to describe it as attachment, to me, was an anathema. And when, you know, when we published this work, we, we talked in part one about me getting you know, bad press. That is nothing compared to what happened when we published this paper and the Daily Mail or somewhere similar. There are other newspapers available and maybe I'm not quite representing the Daily Mail. I said, scientists find out what we always knew. Cats hate their owners. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it came through. You should have seen the vitriol I got. And I remember oh, it was really? just before Christmas. You know, wow. I got emails and it's strangely, especially from the US, say, I've oh. got lots of money. I'm going to spend it on ruining your career. And you just think <laughs> it was really bizarre. But anyway, yeah. so that wasn't what we were saying. Um, but, you know, and I, th I think you're spot on. And I think there's a big difference. The reason about the Ainsworth test and because of the Ainsworth test, to me, attachment is it's not about you're providing the resources. And that that may be important. But what the Ainsworth test is. I get a sense of safety and security, social support from yeah. you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. that's the dimension that I think is important. That's what that's what attachment is. If I'm attached to you, then it means you know I'm dependent on you. I feel safe and secure. And if you're a young infant, of course you you're attached to yeah. your mother because losing her is life and death situation. She's right, the provider right, right. of food and whatever. Um, but also that that uh, safety and security. And this is what I'm saying. I think some people, they so instrumentalize their relationship, this click, treat, click, treat, that even though they do sit with their dog and they hug their dog, because 99% of their interaction with the dog is a click and a treat, I'm not sure that those dogs, I don't know, I'm going to get all sorts of emails here, really <laughs> necessarily love their owners. They see, well, so we... food, they see them as food dispensing. So, so, so my, my question is, I, I, I agree, you know, that the genetic stuff and the, the stuff, you know, with the um, genetic tendency for dogs to be hypersocial, absolutely, I think is really compelling. And for many years, you know, I used to say to our students, you know, there isn't another species on the planet that can meet a complete stranger and be rolling around on the floor with them within a matter of seconds. If we did that, right. we'd get arrested. Yeah, right? well, I mean, it's truly abnormal, really. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that it's and, and again just just to and, um, sort of raise the question I'm not sure that that's unique to humans as I said because dogs do it with dogs so do mm. you think that when you say that dog is love do you think it is a unique ability that's been selected towards humans because if I'm honest that's the impression I got from the book but maybe I misread it but I think it's dogs are hyper social with their own species as well and we've sort of we've you know kicked into that and we've exploited that and it might be that as a result of domestication it's one of the things that we wanted um, we wanted them to be able to cooperate um it it um and because dogs perhaps are hypersocial that's also why they're perhaps more hierarchical and that's what some of the um, other data show and i know people don't like the word dominance but dominance doesn't mean aggression but hierarchies are there um in so much as understanding who takes precedence in a situation as opposed to who's going to win the fight but do you think it's something that is unique that the dog has been selected for that towards humans or not well so daniel you've you've covered an enormous range <laughs> Sorry, of things. I've, I've had a so, run <laughs> so to take to take the the actual the actual question no i do not believe well so yes and no no i do not believe that dogs affectionate orientation to humans is unique to humans mm -hmm. and somewhere in the book or somewhere i say it's not about us it's about them mm -hmm. they clearly have this exceptional capacity ability drive call it what you will to form strong emotional bonds with members of any species that they meet early in life and so in the book i talk about going out you know here arizona is it is the wild west and and we went out we made a trip, I don't know, three or four hours drive northeast of here to the corner of the state to visit some goat ranchers who I found online because they have livestock guarding dogs and their dogs hang out with the goats. And I have somewhere, I have a super cute photo of a mother goat 
sleeping with her head on the rump of one of these dogs with her kid, her baby goat, nestled in between her and the dog. You know, it's a super cute uh, picture. So on the one hand, it seems pretty clear that dogs can form these kinds of bonds with members of any species. However, the existence, the selection pressure, I don't believe that humans played much of a role in most of the process of domestication. I, I think it happened around us, uh, but it wasn't our ancestors saying, oh, well, it's time we made a friendlier wolf. Mm. But the selection pressure that led dogs to have this capacity, the changes in their behavioral development, their critical period of social imprinting, all of that good stuff, the selection pressure was almost certainly to have relationships with us because we were and are the source of their nutrition. We were the resource that they were adapting to forage on. And the ability initially just mutual tolerance and then later, perhaps thousands of years later, to actually care about each other to some degree uh, was clearly advantageous for the dogs towards humans. But there was nothing in biology that could be adjusted so that the dogs would only form relationships with human beings and would avoid forming relationships with goats. Okay. I just don't believe there's anything in biology could be could be tweaked so that you could direct the target species that the dogs would seek relationships so, with. So here's my alternative hypothesis, slightly alternative okay. hypothesis, and it's slightly nuanced. And I know we've chatted in the past about domestication and um, uh, so I'm, and I, you know, I'd, I'd like to chat to more sort of uh, people who work in, in the, the field, but yeah, the hunting and dogs thing seems to make sense. And, you know, and the, the story is getting stronger in that regard. I'm just one, th th this is one of the things though that I find interesting. Um, and it's a slight extension of humans, you know, why Homo sapiens displace Neanderthals? And I know, you know, Pat Shipman has a, a particular view about it, and I'm not subscribing to her view. Uh, it's an interesting book if you want to read her book. I've forgotten what it's called. It's actually over there somewhere. Um, I'll put it up on the website. But Homo sapiens are so puny compared to Neanderthals. Um, but they, they still managed to displace them. Now, I, I'm not... As I said, I'm not saying that it's because humans had dogs, but but I I just think you when you look at the weapons that Homo sapiens had as they came out of Africa, and actually Homo sapiens were seem to be have a pretty good track record of destroying megafauna wherever they go. I don't see that they've got the weapons to do that. You know, they're good at throwing light spears. Whereas Neanderthals stand there with a much sturdier spear and stab and potentially can kill. So this, this, is, this is where I'm coming from. And as I said, this is just pure speculation, but it's a great chance. It's, you know, this is the sort of thing um, I, I've wanted to chat to you for about. So I just wonder, and I, I, I just wonder if actually, you know, there are hints of dog domestication in lots of places. And I think there's been lots of failed domestication simply because it was because of the circumstances in so much as, I just wonder if Homo sapiens are pretty good at injuring megafauna and wolves are pretty good at finishing it off. And the tools that we have are also pretty good at driving off wolves. So I go and to put it in a simple terms, I can injure the mammoth, yeah, or the, the other animal and it runs off or whatever, and, and the deer. And sometimes I might be able to kill it. Let's take deer rather than mammoths, actually. The deer then scarpers off. The wolves manage to trace it. Well, I can find out where the wolves are. Um, and I've got all my spears. And I can chuck them at those wolves and, and sort of scoot them off. And I can't take the whole animal on my back. I, I take what I need and I leave the, the rest. And actually, maybe it was, you know, and when you start to think about megafauna, you're encouraging hypersociality between wolves to form even larger groups. And then it becomes that we, the relationship with humans. So the sociality is not because of the cooperation in hunting. You know, it was purely coincidence. This was a, this, you know, we both got a meal out of killing this large animal. Um, and then that ability to get a bigger group of animals around these, um, uh, because, uh, 
we'll, we'll talk about Wolf Park uh, in, in a minute. And I remember I went to Wolf Park in the um, late 80s when I was a student. And, and in honor of that, I have worn this T-shirt. For those of you who are listening to the audio field, this will mean nothing to you. But this T-shirt I bought 32 years ago in Wolf Park. <laughs> I don't wear it very often simply because I did. I thought it was so beautiful. Um, I just sort of just have it to look at. Um, and, you know, and I remember Eric showing, you know, he, he was brilliant to me. He was so good. I, I don't know. Was Eric alive when you first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. So, I mean, Eric was such a nice guy. Uh, and Pat Goodman was, and he still is an amazing um, person. But, you know, and he, because I was over there as a, a vet and I was trying to learn a little bit and he put on one of the displays for me where he gets the bison and he gets the wolves and you just see the wolves check the bison circle mm -hmm. and the wolves, I, I don't know if they still do it. You know, the wolves just test and no weaknesses, I'm off. You know, wow. they, just, they just give up. And I just thought, yeah, it was it's such a fantastic experience. Um, yeah. And you just thought, yeah. Now, if they were injured, that would be a different story. You know, dogs are incredibly perspective, uh, pers pers ugh, perceptive. <laughs> um, and wolves are too. You know, they'll pick out the injured one. And he would only do this. And he said to me, you know, I'll only do it if I'm sure. And they had calves. And he said, but they can form a big enough circle. They can protect the right. calf. I wouldn't do it if I thought one of them was, I mean, you know, he goes and checks the bison before he goes and does that exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just thought, well, you know, the humans can give the injury, the dogs can, and the wolves can pretty well pick up which one it's worth. And they don't have to be able to communicate much to each other if they're following very simple rules that, you know, go for the lame one. And I remember seeing a wonderful computer simulation, actually, of just these dots that followed this simple little pattern. And it looked like wolves hunting. And the ultimate yeah, yeah. was, if you end up at a certain distance at the front end, you have to bite the neck because you're going to get killed yeah. by this thing in yeah. front of you. Um, and you just think, yeah, and it just looked like, you know, a, a pack of wolves hunting. And that doesn't involve any cognition um, at all. You know, that's a simple, that was a relatively simple computer program um, that, that did that. Yeah. And so, yeah, anyway, I, you know, I'm, I'm going on a well, bit so, of a rant, but this, 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 my head is buzzing with these because I wanted to chat to you about these things yeah, for yeah, a long yeah. time. And I just don't, I, I, I'm just wondering if I can be critical, whether you've fallen into your own trap of going for the attractive explanation, thinking that it's the human side when actually maybe evolution had already selected for it. Okay, humans were involved, but not in that direct way. So I, I don't think the humans were directly involved. I don't think the human yeah. action, intention, cognition mm. played any role. I yeah. think that, I think that, so to this day, your erstwhile colleague, I'm afraid I'm going to mangle her first name and probably the pronunciation of her last name, Malgazetta. Malgazetta. Yeah. Malgazetta. She was involved, is involved out in Poland in these wonderful studies that show that different groups of wolves specialize on different kinds of prey. And even though their territories overlap, the different groups of wolves prefer not to, they, they prefer to marry they prefer to mate with, to pair with wolves who come from the same guild, wolves mm. who are specializing on the same prey, which makes perfect sense. Mm. And that that is actually visible in their DNA, that they are obviously the DNA changes, you could say unimportant. It's not, it's not morphologically visible. It's not really behaviorally visible, but there is evidence there that you can get um, some divergence of different groups of wolves based on their prey specialization. And so I think that back over 20,000 years ago, during the Ice Age, on occasion, people became relatively settled and had surplus resources, and some wolves scavenged on those resources, and probably they became scavenger specialists, like the wolves in Poland become specialists on different prey species. And so over time, they diverged genetically from the wolves who were continuing to specialize on live prey. But I don't think that people and those wolves had any kind of a relationship at all, not even the accidental relationship of, you know, the humans start a hunt and the wolves come along and help finish it off. Because I just don't think that it's likely that humans would uh, need that. Our ancestors were puny, sure, but they were ingenious and they had hunting tools, they had bows and arrows, they had spears, and they had terrific vision so that they were very well able to hunt without the assistance of any other species 
in the open environments of the Ice Age. And I think then that you get wolves who become a bit sort of scavenging specialists. And that is then the selection pressure that causes wolves to change into the animals that deserve to be called dogs. And then you need for the hunt, for a relationship to develop, I think you need a quite different environment. And in the book, I talk about going hunting in Nicaragua with the Mayana mm. people. And there, they could not hunt without dogs, even though their hunting technique is very basic, very primitive, could have been done by humans tens or even hundreds of thousands of years ago. The crucial thing is that because the planet is now not in an ice age and it's warm, they're hunting in a tropical rainforest. And you know the thing with tropical rainforests that everybody's seen in documentaries and so on is twofold. One is you cannot see a bloody thing because it's very, very visually dense. Yeah. As a human reliant on your eyes for hunting, you are crippled. You can't detect prey in that environment. And the second thing is you cannot move through that environment because just like in the Tarzan movies, it's full of creepers and stuff. And, you know, they get, the guys have to go forward with their machetes, painstakingly cutting a path just to move through it. Whereas your dog is a much smaller animal that moves as a quadruped moves very, very quickly. And so the dog has two skills that the human doesn't have, but desperately needs for a successful hunt under those conditions. But then the crucial thing is, the crucial third thing is that the dog relative to the wolf has lost a skill. Because if the dog could still complete kills on its own, it would and the human might catch up hours later and there'd be nothing left to eat because the dog would have killed the prey and eaten it. If you try and go hunting with a wolf, the wolf will have a successful hunt and you may show up hours later and there'll be precious little for you aside from wolves' reluctance to share. So you get a true symbiosis with dog and human hunting in tropical and deciduous forests that could not, would not have existed between wolf and human in open steppe landscapes or um, you know the very open forests that you find in cold climates. But, so I okay. think you first of all have to have a process of domestication, of transition from wolf to dog. And only after the dog has been created, if you like, only after there are things that have these qualities, uh, which includes the inability to complete and kill a hunt, kill a prey, only then can you have the intimacy of relationship starting to develop. Only then do they really need each other. I, 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 yeah, and I agree with you entirely with that. You know, you, you, yeah, you can't make friends with somebody who's going to kill you when you turn your back. <laughs> yeah. Well, and um, who doesn't need you? Has no, yeah. There's no basis for reciprocation. Um, and, but I just, yeah, okay. Um, so, so my thought on that was more that, okay, so we've got the, the hunt, but you know there's these evidence of these failed domestications and i just wonder if you know there's there's a very that very fine balance between the advantages of not of being not being too afraid of humans and, and being attracted to them versus the humans are going to kill you you know yeah in that early stage and i just wonder sort of how much selection occurred at that level and then you know the humans would be more tolerant of the individuals that actually were weaker and had yeah. those those yeah. dog-like features that the, the yeah. powerful jaws potentially but um the other thing no. to keep in mind is that our ancestors were basically camping <laughs> so yeah. they didn't have they didn't have the luxurious homes that professors in the united kingdom and the united states enjoy they were their lifestyle was equivalent to what we would call camping that's number one and number two is that they didn't have contraception, right? Mm. If you watch that British TV show, Call the Midwife, right? Mm. It's, it's not like it's a brilliant program, but it's very interesting to be reminded that until very, very recently, human lives were full of offspring. And that changed 70 years ago. And we've become used to a world where there are almost no children. You have two sons, I have one. You know, that's perfectly normal, mm. right? But that wasn't normal for our ancestors. Their camps, were unprotected there were no wolves if you if you imagine them domesticating wolves they they didn't have leashes and chains and fences they just had whatever animals were running around were running around and you had your you know you had your your you were pregnant you had a nursing baby you had a toddler 
you had a three-year-old, you had a five-year-old, you had a seven-year-old. Did, did they would you, be because so such a high attrition rate. by your camp wolves, sorry? I just, I'm, would you have so many kids? Because there was such a high attrition rate. Of, well, but you know, I mean, and, the attrition is that the wolves were eating them, right? Well, I, I, you know? I even if, if I go back to my grandfather's generation, you know, and, uh, you know, and I, turn of the 20th century, I look at how many brothers and sisters he had and how many of them actually survived to adulthood, well, you right, know? Right, right, right. And they weren't, wolf, they, they weren't killed off by well, wolves, right. but, that but was, okay. But that was... Um, okay, that was industrial pressure. That was the back. industrial period and... and and the, the waves of infectious disease that came over uh, populations that lived so densely together. Um, I mean, there would have been, there was indeed infectious disease tens of thousands of years ago, but it wasn't as major a contributor to um, mortality. There were, there were accidents and, you know, you're, one of the toddler would be forever getting eaten, you know, <laughs> you know the, yeah, there's a pregnancy every year or so. Mm. And with some depressing frequency, the wild animals would would eat your your yeah. young before they reached a higher age. So you weren't you weren't in a hurry, you know, to make friends with this. This where's this picture from of the of the the woman nursing a baby? It's just a painting, right? It's fantasy. Well, bas- nursing a baby and petting a wolf. I mean, no, absolutely <laughs> not. No, I don't think so. Yeah, you have to have dogs before you can have a relationship with them. You cannot, for all of our wonderful experiences at Wolf Park. I mean, that's a very protected environment. Um, yeah, you, and children are not allowed in for one yeah. thing. I mean, you 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 cannot do that with so, the gray wolf. So yeah, you you mentioned that, and and that was one of the things in the book which you describe your first encounter with a wolf. <laughs> and yeah, again, for me, that is something that was etched on my mind. I I went and spent some time with them. And they said, you can't go into the wolf enclosure until we know that you're, you know, if you show any weakness, you you could get killed, whatever. And once we feel that you could, um, you know, you understand, you spent time watching the wolves, then, you know, and we think you're safe, we'll let you in. It also seemed to coincide with the time that some of the wolves had ear infections and I was the vet student. (laughs) Uh, I'll I'll tell you about that in a minute. Well, actually, I'll tell you that now. So, um, because after the first encounter, I then had to treat the wolves and uh, Pat Goodman, you know, who is a uh, native North American, I think she's Cherokee. Um, and she's such a phen- I mean, I don't know what she's like now. I haven't seen her for years. So a phenomenal person, the way she interacts with the wolves, but she would do what she called tea towel. She'd get a wolf and hang it over her arm. <laughs> you know, she, she could hold her arm out and have a whole wolf draped over it. And, um so and you know i had to put the eardrops in and that's how she do it but, but for the alpha male she said no way if you try to do that with him he will kill you um so she said you know i will just distract him and you will put the eardrops in and i was thinking you know okay i've been around the wolves i'm pretty relaxed around the wolves now but you obviously you don't totally relax and you mentioned in the book uh, about monty sloan who, who does the photography and i think he still does the photography there and I was thinking, you know, I'm doing pretty good here, and I would, I would put the eardrops in the uh, in the wolf's ears. <laughs> Monty showed me the pictures, and I'm thought like this an arm's length, <laughs> thinking I'm totally natural in my body language. I couldn't be more removed from this wolf. I'm petrified, yeah. it's going to turn around and kill me. But um, um, anyway, so. Yeah, no, and that, that's the thing. You you think at the time that you're behaving in a certain way, but it, you, you know your body language gives you away so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that first encounter, and I can still remember it. You know, and they told me stand with your back against the fence, and you know the wolf bounds up, and I can't remember who it was, and just these two massive paws on yeah. my arm as they told me, and then you're six inches away from its muzzle. Yes. Yes, it is one of the most amazing experiences in life. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But as I say, I think we have to be careful. Not by the way, Pat is uh, still going strong, and Monty too. Pat's just just retired or just coming up to retirement. So, uh, but still the same as ever. Um, but that experience of of the contact that we have both had at Wolf Park with wolves, where they hand rear the wolves and they take the pups from the mother at 10 days of age and they're with the pups 24 7 i mean it's extremely difficult to bring wolves to that status and then when we go in when they let people like us outsiders in with the wolves it's an immense emotional experience um 
but it, it would be wrong to imagine that that somehow would be what it could have been oh, like. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I um, I visited some uh, filmmakers in Israel, and the cameraman had hand reared some wolf pups, yeah, some yeah, Arab wolves, yeah. which are a much smaller subspecies of wolf, and um, in a kibbutz, which okay, they have they have concrete living structures. They actually also have air raid shelters, but it's a little bit closer to how people lived, you know, thousands of years ago, a community tied together. Um, and, uh, and he was telling me that the, that the other residents of the kibbutz were not at all happy about him having these hand rear wolves and were really quite terrified of them. And he himself had a lot of scarring on his arm yeah from disputes that he had had with his wolves. I mean, it's, it was immediately clear to me that you couldn't have hand-reared wolves or wolves of any kind in an open human community living as our ancestors did, as I say, more or less just camping with much less physical protection that they could have had yeah. you know, than we expect today. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Pat, I actually I was in touch with her a few years ago because one of my students, got interested in the subjects of why dogs roll in feces and what feces oh, yes. and Pat her master's is actually in that topic in wolves oh, really? she's one of the I few people who's researched it huh. and we've we've got tons of data and we uh, um I, I must get around to writing it up because the, and the student did quite a good job it just needs a more sophisticated analysis because we're trying to look at the different reasons of what they roll in you know fox poo versus their own other dog poo versus deer poo whatever to try and test some of the hypotheses but um, with, with dogs now not yeah with, with dogs, dogs rather with than with wolves but we, we right. sort of when we looked we found that the you know when we're looking for literature on the subject one of the few pieces of literature was pat's uh, master's thesis so right if, you, right. if you're over there give, do give her my regards of course yeah um and um anyway so yeah, so no, I think you're, you're right. There, there is a tremendous romanticism. It is an amazing experience and we've got to be careful of just, uh, yeah, sort of uh, completely romanticizing it um, from, uh, yeah, from, from that point of yeah. view. So, okay, so one of the things which I just wanted to explore with you, which you mentioned in the book, and because this is something that I talk to the students about, um, you mentioned the Bar Harbor work and the very first podcast I did was with Kathy Houghton. She spent some time at Bar Harbor. Was, oh, really? I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah. So she, she, as a student, she spent some time at Bar Harbor. Um, and um, so in the paper where they talk about the socialization, and again, this is something which I'm a little, I, I, I tend to be critical of. I'm, I'm concerned the way that, <coughs> excuse me, um, socialization has become this sort of, almost excuse for dog behavior who said oh well he's missed his socialization period and again you know it, it, we were talking in part one about you know Lorenz and um and, and Tinbergen etc and you know they were great ideas for the time and they started to tell us about the sensitivity but you know your first experience has enormous impact on your second experience of something yeah yeah, yeah. um and whilst there might be a degree of sensitivity, this idea that, you know, socialization ends at 12, 14, 16 weeks, wherever you want to cut it, and then the dogs, you know, have not been socialized, I, I, I think does a tremendous disservice for the potential in dogs. The problem is, if you've got a dog who has been reared in a barn somewhere, you've got to realize that the first encounter it has with a human, it has with a human with at a different stage of emotional development to the two week old puppy that first yeah 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 and therefore it responds like a 20 week old dog and yeah. its number one thing is anything i'm not familiar with i'm wary of yeah 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 now yeah. in the the paper by um oh the the, the science paper and i've forgotten um, freeman isn't it Freeman, yeah, by Freeman, he talks about, and the dogs could not be socialized despite extensive petting. Now, if you are scared of humans, extensive petting means scaring the shit out of the dog, to put it no fine. Right, 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 right. right. once already, so I can swear now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that is not how you treat a dog that has not been socialized. You well, can socialize a dog that, you know, after 12 weeks without any, and, you know, and we, we could talk about the criticisms of isolation experiments. It tells you what, you know, 
an isolation experiment only tells you if, if the dog's turned out normal, it tells you what's not necessary. It doesn't tell you what is necessary. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, when you look at that work and you read it carefully, and I think this is something we've got to be very careful of is, you know, they say despite extensive petting, well, from the dog's perspective, that was not a pleasant experience. If you knew what you were doing and you work at the dog's pace, you can turn those dogs around. And I think there's so much more potential. And again, this is me coming from it from the point of view of the clinical behaviorist having to deal with these dogs. Too many people say, oh, well, he wasn't socialized, so he's going to be like that. No. You know, well, I so, just... so I so I think, Daniel, you're touching on this isn't the first time this has come up. And, and, and that is that there are domains that are enormously important to us in our work helping dogs and that are enormously valuable to the population at large in trying to understand the nature of the relationship they have with their dogs. And these boil down to very, very weak empirical bases with few or no studies. So you're talking about a study that was carried out, I think it was carried out in the late 1950s, wasn't it? Yep, I mean, it was a very long time ago. Yeah. I mean, our field of interest, animal behavior, it's not quite like genetics where they have some new machine coming out every couple of months and they can achieve something radically different. And yet, you know, even so our procedures evolve and our experimental techniques evolve and particularly our statistics has evolved a lot. So to think that we're basing all of this that we tell people about a critical period for socialization on the basis of a single study. And you see that it's three dogs, by the way, that, that fit well. into that group. When you look at the population, you realize it's three dogs. You know? Well, I at think it's, time, it's there, oh, there two were three dogs. breeds. There were more than three dogs. No, no, but with the actual experiment, that experiment with the lack of socialization, there were something like 20 odd dogs in total. Yeah. Four, oh, or five, four or five of them were isolated at yeah, two yeah, weeks, yeah. you know, yeah. so, four or so, five of them. So you, you so then realize that the sample size is based on about the, the conclusion of the 12 weeks, I think is based on two dogs that were actually yeah, isolated yeah, yeah, yeah. for two weeks, two or three and, dogs. And one of them, so, they couldn't, they petted intensely. It seems, it seems so foundational, both applied wise and in terms of basic understandings. And yet... God knows why, nothing like it appears to have ever been attempted again. Well, now, it's too expensive, are, that's why. <laughs> well, it would, be, it would be sort of expensive, although goodness knows not expensive on the scale of other domains of science. Mm. Um, it clearly was unethical because it's, I actually had, a, in my book, I speculate that the unsocialized animals were destroyed. And I speculate that the experimenters knew this would be the case and I actually got a letter from and I've now for, I got the letter from the I mean all the principals are deceased long gone mm -hmm. but a daughter of one of them and I forget now whether it was John Paul Scott's daughter or John Fuller's daughter mm -hmm. sent me a letter an actual letter on paper saying that I was right to speculate that the dogs had been destroyed but that I was wrong to speculate that the experimenters had always realized that would be the case and okay. accepted that lightly. She said that it, it upset her father deeply that they ended up in a situation where they had to destroy the dog. Mm. Um, so, but I think, I think we could find ways of doing that experiment that would not lead to the dog needing to be destroyed. Uh, and I think it desperately needs to be revisited. There's plenty of anecdotal evidence. I mean, you meet you dogs. Yeah. Are you familiar with the project called Generation Pup? No. What's that? The Generation Pup. I, I, I'll let you sort of finish. But Generation Pup is an initiative being run by Dogs Trust with Rachel Casey heading it up. It's uh, Dogs Trust, the research. They're looking to collect the lifetime data on 10,000 dogs. Oh, my in, goodness. In the real oh, world. Um, wow. And, you know, it's it's a massive investment. Um and it's real dogs in the real world, you know, the sample sizes and, you know, Dogs Trust have uh, underwritten it. And they, they, you know, I think initially they thought they'd recruit the dogs over a course of three years. I, it must be it must be nearly 10 years now and they're, they're not there yet. But they're looking at this whole lifetime data set of real dogs in the real world to try and work out what is going on. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So. So, um, uh, by the way, I glanced at the time. I am going to have to wrap up in a couple oh, of minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you know, we're building an emphasis. Em yeah, we're building an edifice 
on a very narrow pedestal of data. And we really need to go back in. I think we could find ways of doing this. So for example, uh, there are so many anecdotes about dogs who ultimately end up seeming to form at least some kind of tolerant, friendly relationship with a member of another species that they did not meet during the alleged critical period for social imprinting. Mm. So my own dog has gradually fallen in love with our cat and she didn't meet a cat until she was 12 months old. That should not be possible. It shouldn't mm. be possible for her to form a relationship with a member yeah. of a species she didn't meet. So, and we need, we need this knowledge, but this is, this is a problem. A lot of our science is driven by, is funded by charities, who to a greater or lesser degree have their own agendas and act as pressure groups pushing for certain kinds of results. We mentioned the National Canine Research Council, which would be a particularly egregious example, but these various charities that fund our research are not like, um, I'm not even sure what it's, what used to be called the SERC. I don't think it's called that anymore. Uh, BBSRC or yeah, RC UK, yeah, Research yes. Council. They're not, they're not, they're not government run uh, research yeah. groups that are just interested in getting solid knowledge. They are interested in putting forward a per certain point of view. Um, and so that's a problem. And then we get quite a lot of research that's done basically without any funding, which then tends to be often rather too small scale to really have much impact or on questions which I'm sorry, I find really rather trivial. Um, so, so big questions, big questions about how do dogs form relationships with people? Is it only possible that if they've had crucial relationships at a certain early stage of life, could that be remediated? You mentioned that the paper, which is a brief report, talks in the vaguest possible terms about how they attempted to make friends with the dogs that hadn't met people for the first 12 or 14 mm -hmm. weeks of life. But A, it's vague. And B, as you said, it, they, they mentioned petting, which sounds like the wrong way to have gone. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. damn, I mean, we really yeah. need to do that study properly because it's important. So do you have time for one more question? It depends how long it takes. I've got about four minutes. Oh, um, dogs dying for others. What's your take on that? <laughs> I doubt it. I, well, I mean, I doubt that they would that they do it knowing what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that was my thought as well. Okay. Uh, in which case, <laughs> I, I, no, I, I appreciate you giving up the time. Um, I wish we had longer. Um, yeah. I, 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 it's been lovely to catch up with you. And I'm sure we'll catch up again before too long. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for all you, that you do, uh, you know, for dogs. And uh, as I said, the other thing about doing these uh, podcasts, is it gives me a chance to say, because, you know, we often chat as scientists, but we don't actually say thank you to each other. And, I, <laughs> you know, and I don't think you realize how much of an influence this sort of your writings have had on me. And I really appreciate oh. that. And, um, you know, and I, I you know, I, I love the conversations that we have. Um, and I hope it won't be too long before you're back in the UK and that uh, we get a chance to catch up and show you what's going on. And, um, um, you know, and maybe I'll make it over to Arizona. And as you pointed out, I should not go camping in the desert in a sleeping bag um, because there are coyotes and scorpions there <laughs> because I remember yeah, I said to well. you that I just sort of slept because I was hitchhiking and I got stuck and I just slept. And you <laughs> said, weren't you worried about coyotes and, and scorpions? I thought, no, I'd never thought about that. So <laughs> I'm a bit older now. So, um, but, uh, you know, I hope we get to catch up soon. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a lovely uh, chat. It's just been the time oh, I needed today as well. Good, um, good. As well, always. Push my Friday in the right direction. Well, well, you know, and and thank you for picking up the email and and pushing us to do this because I've really enjoyed myself and and I I have you know your group is absolutely I think one of the most productive and important in in the world at the present time and I'm only so this oh you know these Zoom chats if I enjoy if I don't enjoy a Zoom chat then hey that's no good but when I do enjoy it I also get this this frustration that we're not actually together yeah, but i know i'm i'm pretty optimistic i'll get to the uk this summer yeah well i hope so and uh, you know i hope that uh, i'm not sure the weather will be going anywhere i was thinking if, if things improve i might get over to the states so one way or the other let's hope we don't yeah. cross an aeroplane's going in opposite directions <laughs> after all this time thanks yeah. a lot so much clive thanks for everything oh. and um uh, i'll catch up with you again soon cheers okay bye for now bye now <laughs>